Hi, I'm Jim Fenton. I'm based in California, and I'm happy to be able to come to PasswordsCon this year uh, virtually in, in Stockholm. Um, and I uh, hope you've had a, had a good conference so far. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, the so-called passwordless solutions that are uh, on the market uh, that are being promoted. And, and you know, the questioning this uh, assertion that the future is passwordless. So let's let's explore that a little bit. There are a lot of marketing pitches that are promoting a passwordless future. And uh, does that, you know, we, we kind of wonder, does that mean that users really don't have to remember anything? Or um, does this mean that they're going to be using biometrics or physical authenticators or combinations of those things for multi-factor authentication? So not to pick on any particular vendor, but I kind of just collected a, a, a few of the headlines from, from some of the passwordless vendors that are out there uh, and, and talking about what they're, uh, what they're saying. You know, it's the future, they, you can log in without using a password, all of those sorts of things. So this creates an expectation for users. Does this mean that they don't need to remember anything at all? I mean, people would, generally like that or at least think that they do because you know they right now we're being subjected to having to remember scores or hundreds even of uh, of passwords that they're supposed to keep separate for each uh, site that they go to and, and and so forth so one way to approach this is to use a physical authenticator by itself and the, the you know the most common example being a, a door key like the key to your home uh, we do this all the time we don't do it very often in the case of online accesses, though, and, and there are some good reasons for that. The, the, the threats from using just a physical authenticator by itself are generally uh, that it could be stolen, it could be lost, it could also be broken, which is more of a denial of service sort of uh, threat. Uh, and it could also be duplicated. And, you know, of course, keys are easy, easy to duplicate. But generally, you would notice if you didn't have your key on your person for a little while. It feels a little different in your pocket, unless you've got dozens of them, I guess. Um, and uh, but in the case of a of a key, in in, in the sense of a an authentication secret that might be on your telephone or your laptop or something of that sort. It's possible that some malware would come along. Somebody might borrow the device briefly and um uh extract the, the the secret from it um so as a result of that we we tend to avoid using physical authenticators by themselves and in fact maybe almost to, to to too much of an extent um so this is great it's a it's a passwordless uh, authentication method but it's not two factor it's not really an improvement in security like so many of the passwordless vendors are promising here Another approach is biometrics. Again, it's passwordless, but it's only single factor. Um, I mean, a lot of people really think that that biometrics are the ultimate in security. I mean, you see this in the movies. Uh, you go to the, uh, you see the the uh, person going to some sort of a high security thing, uh, putting their fingerprint on the uh, sensor, or maybe looking into a sensor for an iris scan. Um, and the door opens and they're admitted and, and gee, this must be really good. The problem is that it, that there are almost all of the biometric modalities that exist have ways that the, the, the biometric can be obtained unintentionally. Of course, a fingerprint, you leave it on every, on every, uh, uh, drinking glass that you use. So if you go to a restaurant, um, the waiter could take your you know a uh, copy of your biometric if if they if they really wanted to um, uh, similar thing with um, uh, you know iris patterns apparently iris patterns are fairly easy to obtain especially if you're blue-eyed it turns out um, by just a, a high resolution photo of the person so uh, you know there there are concerns about the about the security of biometrics from that standpoint. And they're also not revocable. So, um, you know, if, if somebody does get a hold of your fingerprint or your iris pattern or something like that, this is not something that you're uh, going to be able to change. 
Um, the other the other issue is that that biometrics aren't a deterministic uh, authentication method or, or aren't an, a deterministic factor. Um, if you it, it's a measurement, so unlike the password is either right or wrong. Uh, your physical authenticator either has the right key or the wrong key on it. But a biometric, it if it's if it's close, and and that's a, a decision that the, uh, the the biometric system has to make. If if the the measurement is close enough that it, it believes that it's really you, then it will uh, accept the biometric. And you know they're doing better and better on this these days. They're you know uh, one in ten thousand, one in a hundred thousand uh, false accept rate, which is the measurement of these things, uh, is is uh, getting to be fairly common, better than just a few years ago. But you 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 still have uh, the the other concerns about uh, uh, whether the uh, uh, whether the biometric might have been compromised. And of course, the test conditions for these false accept rates are what they refer to as zero effort attacks. Um, you just, somebody, a random person puts their fingerprint on the sensor or random person looks into the iris scanner or, or whatever. Uh, somebody that's a more determined attacker that's intentionally trying to falsify the uh, authentication uh, is going to do better than that. And uh, there's really, I mean, there's some research, but not a great deal of research uh, avail available, at least publicly, about um, uh, what the uh, false accept rates are for other sorts of attacks where somebody is trying to, to actually subvert the system rather than just kind of like randomly present their, their biometric. So another approach, uh, again, passwordless, is a physical authenticator with a biometric, and the um, uh, this is this is pretty common now. It's being used with your, uh, you know, uh, an awful lot of uh, phones have uh, biometric sensors on them, either uh, fingerprint or or face uh, recognition types of sensors. Uh, they are passwordless. Uh, they um, mitigate the concern of somebody losing or having an, an authenticator stolen, which is a really good thing. Um, a lot of these devices have the, and, and the technology has gotten to where the, the biometric comparison, the biometric template, what it's comparing against, and the comparison can be all embedded in the device. And that's really good in terms of making sure that um, my, my biometric has to be, uh, uh, can, can only be used on that device. And it isn't something where the biometric could be used broadly on all sorts of devices. You know, I, I'm sure that there are people who would like to be able to go to the convenience store and buy a soda and just put their fingerprint on the sensor and walk out. Um, but the, the, the problem there is that, uh, if if uh, if your uh, fingerprint can be used on just any sensor, it becomes a much more valuable uh, commodity than if your fingerprint can be used only on a specific device, and therefore it's more likely to be uh, attacked in that way. Um, another thing about using biometrics on a device like this is um, that you you really hope that the the, the uh, just unlocking the device isn't the only time that you use the biometric because people have their devices unlocked for all sorts of things. You know, they'll, they'll unlock their device and they'll set it down on their desk and, and go and do some work or something like that. And somebody could just walk by and grab it. Uh, you, for authentication purposes, you would like to have a present the biometric, the, the finger or whatever, uh, in order to, uh, specifically in order to authenticate. And so the, the, the picture that I've got here shows this is actually a Microsoft Authenticator where uh, I've already unlocked my phone. I'm, I'm going into Microsoft Authenticator. It asks me to, to present my fingerprint once, once more time uh, just in order to make sure that it's really authentication that I intend to do. And that's 
uh, I, I think, a very good thing um, because it's really not much more effort to present your, your fingerprint or your face a second time when you want to authenticate. Now, so is, is that good enough? I mean, if you, if you had a, um, uh, something that was uh, uh, something that you have plus a, a biometric, it seems like, seems like life is pretty good. So um, some of you might be wondering why there's a picture of my vegetable garden here. And actually, Pear is probably looking for a cat there. Sorry, Pear, there's no cat. But the, uh, uh, the, the idea here is that when I go out and work in my, in my vegetable garden, my fingers get all dry and sort of dirty and, and, and all of that. I can't use the fingerprint sensor on my phone then. I need to use the pin in order to unlock my phone because my, you know, the, my fingerprints are just messed up. The same thing can happen if I'm washing something and my hands are really wet um, and I want to you know, adjust the podcast that I'm listening to or something like that. I have to unlock my phone with my, with my pin. So, um, and we're probably seeing a fair amount of this with all of the people with facial recognition and uh, uh, wearing masks on account of the pandemic. Um, I haven't actually experienced that. I don't have a phone that does facial recognition, but I expect it, it probably uh, has some problems when I'm wearing a mask. So what do you do then? Well, what you do then is you, you do what, what the uh, um, uh, telephone vendors uh, provide, which is you give an option of either a biometric or a PIN. And uh, so there are a few, um, a few good reasons to do this. One is that you would ideally like it so that if somebody got a hold of my phone and we were concerned about somebody getting a hold of your secret key uh, uh, earlier, we don't, if the, if the, everything required to get the secret key is, is in here and, and I'm somehow able to access the, the, the secure storage in the phone, then, uh, th the fact that the phone can be unlocked with a with a fingerprint means that um, all of the secrets in order to decrypt the secret key, assuming it's encrypted on the phone, uh, are there somewhere. And so I just need to do a little more digging in order to find that. If you're if you're using a pin, that pin can be used to create a derived key that would then be used to unlock the uh, unlock the uh, authentication secret, and so that that's kind of a kind of a good thing. Of course, you know you could probably run through uh, all of the pins in a in a relatively short time, um, but uh, it's it's a you know as as with most things in security, it's a, a question of you know can we make the job a little bit more difficult for the attacker, and it's more difficult for the attacker if they have to uh, go and uh, uh, derive uh, the uh, decryption key for the authentication secret by trying 10,000 pins or something of that sort. Um, another reason to do this is, is the, the false accept rate of the biometric. Uh, you'll find on an awful lot of devices that there's a, it will only give you a few tries before it says, no, your biometric didn't work. You need to enter your PIN. And that's largely uh, due to the, the fact that, you know, the, uh, the biometrics, uh, biometric sensors don't give the same degree of security as, a, say, a strong password would or a cryptographic key. So trying to sort of balance these things, it, it does that. So, if you know this does solve the limitation that I have in my vegetable garden or when I'm washing the car or whatever, um, and it doesn't require the device to contain the clear, uh, clear text secret. You know, when I first power up my phone, I have to use my pin the first time, and then that's sort of cached while the phone is is running for some period of time, and then you know every once in a while I need to enter the pin again rather than a biometric. It's not a huge inconvenience to be able to do that. Uh, and it kind of points out that, that in a lot of cases, the biometrics are really kind of a convenience factor. 
And, and by the way, in terms of the security of this, um, it's really limited by whichever is the weaker, the biometric or the pin. And, you know, they have, they have some different weaknesses from each other, but, you know, anytime that you have the, the option of authenticating using method A or method B, the result has got to be at least theoretically a little bit weaker than either A or B because you've got more ways to attack it now. So going back to the original premise, passwordless authentication. Pins are really just low entropy passwords. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned about the marketing pitch here because a lot of people are going to say, oh, this is great, passwordless authentication. Oh, you got you, you to gotta, uh, still remember a pin. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. Anyhow, um, that's, I'll, I'll let the marketing people deal with that. But um, it kind of, kind of highlights that this is a, um, you know, a kind of a marketing pitch that we're talking about here. Um, so pins are, are, are weaker passwords, but maybe that's okay if we're using it as a second factor or, uh, you, know, on, you know, in addition to a physical authenticator, because um, we don't have, you know, unlike, you know, when you log into a website with a username and password, there isn't, you know, a, a big database there of hashed passwords that uh, people can can go off and attack if, if they're able to get that, that list of hashed passwords. The, the uh, verification of the PIN is local to the device. So again, it's a lower value target if, it's, if, it, can only, if, if it can only be used for one user. And, and it's you know, the fewer things to attack there. So, so that's a good thing. Um, there are uh, you know, lots of uh, brute force attacks on pins that can be made, and as a result, you 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 need to uh, consider what the what the throttling is. Uh, is there a limit on how many tries I can make during a given hour, given day, whatever, in order to uh, keep people from just trying, um, you know, all of the you know all say ten thousand pins if there's if there's four digits, and and there are people. In fact, I've got there's in one of my references that comes up later, um, there's a, a bunch of researchers that built a little uh, um, uh, device that went and, and actually would, would automate the uh, entry of pins into a, in, into a phone for testing purposes. And, um, uh, you know, so, the, so those sorts of things do, do exist. And if you're, you know, going to use a pin, you need to be a little bit careful because not all pins are created equal. You know, some of the research shows that one, two, three, four has is used somewhat more than 10% of the time by people. Zero, 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 zero is frighteningly common as well. I forget what the exact number is there, but um, you know, one one approach to that is to is to perhaps not allow certain of the really common pins to be used if you're designing an authentication system just in order to keep people from using those things that um, are, are most likely to be guessed in a, in a short time by an attacker. Now there's other, other combinations of um, authenticators that are still passwordless. Um, one that I've seen is there are some things that use two physical authenticators. Um, you know, maybe they'll, uh, you'll use a physical authenticator and then it'll send you a, uh, a text message, which is kind of a proxy for, gee, do I actually have this device? So this is another physical authenticator in that case, if it's, if it's coming to my phone. Um, so that's not two factor because when we say two factor authentication, we mean two different factors, not two of the same factor. <clears throat> I've seen uh, examples where they, they talk about using a physical authenticator and then send you, sending you an email. Well, email is terrible from a lot for authentication. Uh, I know it's very widely used, but it's a, it's a terrible authenticator in so many ways because uh, it's very often not, uh, not secure in, in transit. There's uh, various threats when you uh, uh, have the email stored on a server 
And how do you access your email typically? Probably a password. So not really passwordless anymore, is it? <clears throat> so really don't use email as an authentication method if you can possibly avoid it. Um, the other, of course, the other combination would be two biometrics. And again, of course, that's not two factor. It's, uh, uh, you know, two fingers or a finger and an eye and, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, doesn't, doesn't mitigate any of the, uh, any of the, uh, privacy or, or security concerns with, uh, uh, capturing the biometrics. So it depends on what you call a password, whether the future is really passwordless. Do you mean a password? Do you mean a pin? Do you mean something else? And, uh, or is it possible that when they say it's passwordless, they just mean, well, you don't need just a password. You need a password plus something else, in which case all multi-factor solutions would be passwordless, right? <clears throat> um, if you use a password locally, it's like, you know, unlocking, uh, an authentication application on, on your phone, like I, uh, I showed a picture of earlier. Um, that might have different requirements. I mean, we, we talk about using, you know, long, strong passwords for, for, for normal use. When you're using in connection with an authenticator, um, it probably doesn't have to be as strong. A pin is, is, is probably uh, a reasonable solution there. I don't have a strong opinion about exactly how strong that should be. But um, I mean, the fact that you've got a physical authenticator with it probably uh, relieves some of the requirements on what one would normally consider to be uh, a secure password. And that's presuming, of course, that it's being locally verified, that you're not just using a uh, 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 an authentication device and then doing it as a separate step sending a password to the server, in which case it's, again, being centrally verified and is subject to be, being sort of centrally harvested, if you will. Um, but if you're going to be deploying one of these solutions that is advertised as passwordless, then be careful about what it actually does. Pay attention to what it's actually using, because not all of them are equal. And I, I thought that the, the selection of pins was kind of a particularly interesting topic here. So I uh, collected a few papers on, uh, actually a couple of papers and a, and a pretty good blog post about uh, uh, pin selection and, and pin security that, uh, that you might enjoy. And so now I'll be available if there are any questions. Thank you.